former graduate student here uh, and did a lot of my thesis work related to streetscape design um, and the sort of behavioral and psychological implications of, of streets and how they, they affect the way that we use them and we think about them. Um, so when I was taking a non, mostly non work related trip uh, uh, over to Europe this past spring, uh, Glenn, I think, very um, uh, good suggestion that he had to uh, take some photos and think about streets that I was seeing there and what the um, sort of implications of those of those were. Um, and particularly, I, I focused on street trees in that context, uh, just because, I mean, Europe is in a way kind of famous for its, its tree-lined streets, and it's something that we think a lot about um, that sort of have the archetypal, the archetypal sort of tree-lined avenues. Um, this, this photo is from Rome. It's actually not from my most recent trip, but uh, I think it gives a pretty good impression of the sort of street that you would only really see in that sort of uh, Mediterranean context uh, with the really sort of tall columnar trees that are lining. Um, this is back in the way, uh, it's sort of, sort of the quintessential, quintessential tree-lined street. Um, one of the things that my research as a master's student uh, looked at was how things like trees and buildings around streets define the space of that street and make it sort of a coherent uh, geographic or spatial entity. Um, and you know, the, the, the trees are, are telling us where the boundary of the street is. They're telling us to a certain extent how, how high that space is and what the shape of that space is. Um, and uh, because trees take some time to grow, uh, as you can see in this photo, the, these trees have some age on them. They also give us a, a pretty strong sense of history permanence in a place. Uh, so uh, you can tell that this is this sort of place and this street didn't spring up out of nowhere yesterday. Um, so looking at something that's pretty stark contrast to that, uh, this is another tree-lined street. Um, this is in, in Windsor. Um, sorry, the photos up here aren't so great, but if you look on the side, either side, the contrast is a little better. Um, and, and this is a pretty different place. So, I mean, we've got a similar sense of sort of history and permanence in the infrastructure of this of this place, much of which is defined by the trees. But it's a huge, it's a really broad space, so it's a really different character to it. Um, and so, I mean, you can you can get a very sort of grand effect out of the trees, um, or or you can get a much sort of like cozy or homey effect. You know, really depending. This is the work of landscape architects to figure out how to. Um, you know, what, what sort of effect they want to make out of this. Trees also um, lend a sense of animation to a space. They move in the wind. Um, they are they're naturalistic, of course. And uh, one of their really sort of great characteristics in defining a space of a street is that they allow you to still sort of, there, there's a, a permeability on the sides. And so, um, you know, you can still sort of walk you know, between them. You can walk between the space of the street and the space on either side of it. Um, and that's something that you can't really get out of a fence or a building wall or something like that. Um, and uh, it, it, it is really sort of unique to the trees. Um, and, and trees also, this is the same place in Windsor, uh, just taken from a slightly different angle. Um, they really subdivide a space. And so you can take something that would otherwise, th this is just a particularly good example of this really wide open mall um, that you know otherwise would just kind of feel like a playing field. It was just a really big, um, a big plane of space, and you know the, the trees themselves are doing the work of telling you that you know this is one sort of linear road-like space here, and here is another sort of separate linear space, uh, and there's even a third one over here before you get to the fence, um, and and just you know so the arrangement, and especially in this case a really formal arrangement, is doing all of all of that work for you. So to sort of frame, I, one of the, I was thinking about several things as I was going around Europe and and, uh, and looking at these streets, and we'll try to sort of think about these ourselves as as we go through the pictures today. The first of which is, how do these street tree spaces develop? What's the sort of chronology of that, or what's the um, what's the, the human involvement with that? What's the process? Uh, and these are really only things given that you know, we don't know these places uh, historically, 
we have to sort of try to read clues in the landscape and see what uh, what we think about their, their chronology, what we suspect. And then the next question that I was sort of posing myself is, to what degree is this development intentional? Does it have sort of a human hand behind it and uh, a, a purpose in the way that the trees are put there? Uh, and to what degree is it sort of inadvertent or the force of some other, you know, sort of happenstance? The trees are there and maybe they're an effect of some other sort of intentional process, but they're, they weren't put there to be street trees or to, you know, shape the space uh, in the way that they have nonetheless ended up doing. And then the third question I, I posed was, how are street tree spaces different in urban and rural contexts? Um, and this is a, a question that I've been thinking a lot about actually in terms of uh, recent research that's come up in the state of Vermont where you know folks actually some folks from VTrans have you know saw some of my work on my, my master's thesis which was very urban oriented mostly because that's really where the data was and that's where the literature is based right now um, and we started saying well wait a second we've got all of these treed street spaces or treed road spaces in the state of Vermont many of them are sort of unintentional or informal, but when you cut a road through a forest, you've got a street tree space. Um, and so, you know, how how do these, you know, for, how do these first two questions change basically in, in a, a urban and rural context and what are the, the similarities and differences there? So let's start um, by thinking about the process a little bit. Um, this is in Dartmoor, UK, it's on the Cornwall Peninsula, um, and uh, this, I think, is a pretty, from what I've seen in the UK, this is a fairly common uh, sort of back road situation where you've got a very heavily enclosed sort of country lane of uh, cut through vegetation. And uh, to a certain extent, you've got the trees growing up and you've got the road growing down. Um, there's a lot of cutting here. Uh, and you, you actually, when you're driving around in this area, you see them going around with mowers and you're know, trying to keep the trees and the bushes, the hedgerow back. Um, and so I call this a subtractive space because you're basically taking something that would otherwise be grown in or would be filled in. I mean, the street, uh, this lane is about four feet lower. Uh, if you get up on the hedgerow and look at the field on the other side, uh, it's, it's up at this level here. And so they've dug down into the ground here and they've also, there are probably stone walls back there. There's a lot of, hedgy stuff and there are these trees that have grown up in the hedgerow and they've sort of cut the cut the road through the space um, as it's as it's grown up around it and they keep doing that so that's the carved out uh, sort of street slash vegetation uh, or tree slash vegetation street with that in uh, this has a lot of similarities to a situation uh, this is a, a park right in central Berlin um, that, that is also sort of just cut through the forest. There isn't a lot of intentionality here in the way that the trees are planted relative to the street itself. Um, but, you know, basically someone came along at some point and, you know, cut this road through what seems to be an otherwise naturalistic forest. And I'm sure there was a land, if you ever look at this a park, there's probably a landscape architect back there somewhere um, thinking about what should be planted where, but there's certainly no formality, you know, with trees planted in, in careful rows. Going a little bit further even, um, this is the same park, a different path. Uh, here, there's no linear space defined at all by the trees. I mean, we don't even, like the tree is planted in the middle of the path, or should we say the path just sort of came and went around the tree. Um, and so you've got an enclosed space or a treed, a treed street, but uh, but the trees aren't defining the street at all, which, which is a, a very much in contrast to most most situations where um, where the, the sort of linear cut is really what is defined in that space. Um, so down in Potsdam, this is about 25 kilometers south of Berlin. Um, here is a very formal uh, street tree uh, scene where the trees have very clearly been planted with reference to that path. Um, they're evenly spaced, they're the same species, they are you know, roughly the same age. Uh, this, this has a lot of intention behind it, and this, the street trees were planted, I would, I would hazard to guess, in this situation, because it's, it's not even a, uh, it, it's really not 
particularly rural, you know, there isn't like agriculture on either side of here where there'd be some other purpose for those trees. Those trees are planted there to define the path. Um, there's really no other reason they would be planted there. Um, is that a walking path like that or the tarp morning? It is a uh, historic carriageway and now walking and biking. Yeah. Um, and you can you can read from where the trees are planted um, that it is not a modern roadway because they're not wide enough apart in order to be you know a dual lane carriageway. Although that said, you know, <clears throat> this is a modern you know a, a modern roadway in the UK, um, and they have a very different sense of what constitutes a wide enough street, uh, which is a whole other topic of conversation. Um, but. Uh, yeah, this, this was planted and designed for a different era and is now walking and biking. Feel free to interject. This is a lot about, yeah, just sort of talking and walking. Um, and then going to a, a, a street in, in Paris, this is the Champs-Élysées, which uh, is, I'm pronouncing terribly because I don't speak French, please excuse, but um, this is, an enormously formal sort of treed street, both in the sense that the trees are, you know, as they were in this last picture, the same species, the same age, they're spaced evenly. But here we're not just getting into designing where the trees are and what they are. We're actually sculpting the darn things into what I would say is an architectural material rather than a landscape architectural material. I mean, these have become orthogonal objects uh, and Paris particularly seems to be really famous for, you know, controlling the way that, that their trees grow. Um, they, they want a lot of intention behind behind the space. Um, and this actually, in, in talking with several folks more familiar with sort of European landscape design than me while I was over there, um, this is a, a um, an appreciated contrast by people in, in different sides of the channel in Europe where the Parisians, you know, love the fact that, you know, everything is so sort of sculpted and intentional and folks in the UK in their sort of formal gardens much prefer the, um, the sort of wild, more naturalistic appearance of, of the trees and other foliage. And so um, this becomes as much a reflection of the culture in that place um, as, as anything else. Um, so with this photo, um, I wanted to sort of show how uh, it, the trees aren't all that's sort of framing the space, especially in when you get into more urban contexts. Um, so getting back to that question about sort of what is the difference between urban and rural tree street, um, in an urban context, you've got things like fences and walls and even lampposts, signs that are defining the boundaries of the street space. Um, and a word that I use a lot is enclosure. You sort of feel like this might be even an outdoor room with walls and then, you know, even the lamppost forming a little bit of a ceiling height there. Um, but nonetheless, you know, you've got some trees that are in here, uh, sort of even set back from the roadway, but they're within the frame of view and they're helping to, to frame that space in conjunction with these other elements. Let's see where I'm going next year. Um, so, I mean, in London, a street that's even more sort of framed by just the buildings. Um, and the, the tree is doing a fair amount to further enclose the space here, but this would be uh, enclosed human scale, um, you know, fairly intimate feeling space even without the tree. And, and the tree here is probably doing more to add like a you know, sort of naturalistic texture to the space than, than any sort of physical you know, spatial definition. Um, and you know, here again in London, we've completely removed the tree from the scenario, and we've got all the elements that we might want from a tree. Uh, it's purely, you know, by all of the different textures of the building materials, and the people are doing the movement instead of the trees. Um, and so we might almost make the the hypothesis that trees are more worthwhile in spaces where there isn't a lot else going on, where you know they are the ones that are sort of helping to fill and define the space. And uh, and add that element of like movement and a, a, you know interesting variety of texture to to a space. Um, that's certainly a role for them in a, in a rural setting. 
uh, where you know you just don't have crowds of people all over the place, or or for that matter, in more suburban settings, um, where it's a more managed landscape and you still don't have as many people. Um, here in Berlin, Germany, again, we've got you know a, a huge sort of pretty spare space. This is in East Berlin, um, and it, you know it's an area that has not seen a lot of development activity in the last 50 years for obvious reasons. And um, nonetheless, you know, the trees still play a really big role here in saying, you know, this is sort of the container of the street um, and uh, lending some life to an otherwise really spare street. Um, I think it's beyond what those trees can say. I think that if they were there, it would feel a lot worse. <clears throat> <laughs> it's hard to imagine. <laughs> um, but you can also sort of imagine life beyond the edge of the trees, you know, in the space between the trees and that building, and that becomes almost a haven. You know, you're like getting out of the middle of this. I had to walk out in traffic in order to get to the media to get this picture, and it wasn't awesome. Um, I I took this photo to demonstrate that. To a certain extent, we think of Europe as being a place that is developed, and you know, where everything's sort of in place because you know they've had more time to to do their development. Um, and you know, of course, every street that, that we want trees on has already got them. They're facing the same problems we do. They're you know rebuilding. This is a fairly new, newly designed place uh, in Potsdam with new buildings around it. They've you know in the last several years, this is a bike lane. That's a terrific bike lane. With, um, with somewhat separated different different paper materials. But Europeans are definitely planting trees in the same way that we are. Um, they're all over the place. Uh, and it, that makes it clear that they're putting a lot of effort or a lot of thought into um, you know, these spaces needing to have that extra element um, on top of the architecture that they've, that they've obviously also put effort into. And then there are other spaces, um, again, here in Potsdam, here's an enormous plaza that has very I think very consciously decided not to have trees. This is the same part of the same development, actually. It's basically a 180 view from this. And there's been a very conscious decision. Um, there were some planters over on this side with small, small bushes that won't get too much taller than that with that amount of root space. Um, very conscious effort for this to be a wide open space. And so that is um, you know, another element of that of the European landscape is this sort of monumental openness. Um, that, to a certain extent, we did see in, in some trade spaces at the beginning of the of the slideshow in the UK. But um, you know, there's there are both sides to that coin. Um, and then, you know, furthermore, here in Germany, here's a this is a old airfield that's right in this basically right in the center of Berlin um, that has been converted into a public park. And I mean, this is as extreme as you can get um, in terms of a wide open space, you know, zero vegetation except for the grass, you know, that gets mowed around between all the runways and taxiways. And people love it. People go out there and experience this vast, I mean, it feels like you're in the great plains of the US out here, which is kind of an odd feeling for, um, for you know, that, area, that part of the world. But, um, you know, it, this really just goes to show that there, there isn't, there is a sort of an attractive force about that that tree space that doesn't exist in any other context. Um, people really are drawn to this wide, wide open space. So pulling back a little bit to the relationship between some of the architectural spaces in the city, and this is something that you really don't see in, in the country at all for, for obvious reasons where you just don't have the same development density. This is an arcade uh, in France um, that I think really, you know, to a certain extent, mimics trade spaces. I would, I would, you know, perhaps, and, and, and maybe, I'm certainly not the first person to argue this, that arcades like this are to take their take their design cues from the sort of colonnade of a row of trees around a roadway. Um, and in this park, which is not a roadway, but you know has some of the similar sort of you know uh, formality in terms of the planting and, and the, the the rows of trees around paths, 
um, it, would, it really does remind you um, of the architectural form of the colonnade uh, to a certain extent going you know if, if you imagine that this is based on sort of the natural form of a row of trees this ironically has been taken to the next level where you know the trees are being sculpted probably to look more like a colonnade I mean they're very blocky they've been if you step back these trees have been sculpted like crazy this is again a very Parisian um, style uh, but uh, nonetheless I mean the trees here are are constructing space between them like none other I mean these are, are really highly um, the, the design here is highly intentional to, to create that space um, but then even certainly without that amount of hedge trimming um, you're getting a similar effect this is in London um, in the UK um, there was a fellow who I don't think came back but who saw he, he was here yesterday um, and said he was drawn to come uh, he just came on the wrong day but he was drawn to come by this photo which was on the cover of Glenn's invitation um, and he said that he really liked how this street had um, had an asymmetry in terms of the public space that you know the trees created the trees planted just on this one side meant that this was where you were supposed to be as a you know pedestrian or a um, you know, or as someone just sort of like sitting on these benches or, or whatnot um, and you know the, that the trees communicated that to the user of the street. Um, and I thought that was a, an intriguing observation. Um, and so, I mean, in this case, the trees very seemingly intentionally planted on this side to react to this space, as opposed to the other side where they would have to be much smaller. I and mean, there's just space on the other side. Um, here in, in Windsor, again, you have fairly heavily manicured trees. Uh, but demonstrating that trees don't need much of a canopy in order to do the job. Um, and so here they're forming walls, but not really much of a roof. And you're still getting a very sort of defined space. Um, and to a certain extent, you're getting a shorter space than you might be if the trees were allowed to just sort of keep growing upwards. Um, and, and that lends it a slightly more human scale than you would get with, with trees of a similar age and, and, uh, and girth uh, otherwise. Again, in Pakistan, a really similar effect where um, the trees are very columnar. And this is keeping, uh, one, one of the things that folks talk about being attractive about trees in a lot of circumstances is that they provide shade. Um, but here in Vermont, we have issues with, uh, especially transportation folks actually not wanting shade on roadways because they uh, they keep ice on the roadway. Um, and so uh, I, I liked how this alleyway in, in Potsdam, and Potsdam is a sunny place, but by no, by no means Mediterranean, you know, it, it's a place that needs some warmth and uh, now and then. And uh, these trees define the roadway and sort of uh, you know, have, have all of the sort of nice qualities of meditation along the side without, um, you know, causing us to feel like sort of a dark, a dark space. This has nothing to do with trees, but I, uh, well, it has something to do with trees in the sense that th this is the Berlin Wall Memorial, and it's actually not even my photo, but I was bummed that I didn't take a photo of it, so I stole one from someone else on Flickr. Um, the Berlin Wall Memorial in certain places keeps the wall where it is and then extends along where the wall was with these spindles. And they have a very, very similar effect, especially in their, um, in their sort of relationship to the wall as trees do in their relationship to, you know, like building facades or other walls in a street environment where trees provide a border and they provide a sense of spatial definition without uh, you know without forcing um, you know without actually uh, being a solid boundary it's a porous boundary that um, you can get through on foot uh, and that you can see through and that you know allows you to relate one side to the other uh, and so I thought that was a really good 
demonstration of what what trees provide um, in sort of a sculptural way uh, to to a street barber. Here in Potsdam, um, these are the most. So th this is by no means a rural circumstance, um, but it's more natural than a lot of sort of other sculpted tree scenarios that, that, that you see. This was the, the best example I could find of trees that seemed to be sort of naturally growing and were really only sculpted on one side. Um, but to create, I mean, clearly this line and that line a little less so had been cut by cherry, really tall cherry pickers or other mechanisms in order to keep this as a very, very tight sort of keyhole alleyway. Um, and um, so this was sort of an intentional intervention into what was otherwise a very natural feeling tree environment in order to carefully define that space um, and, and actually keep it from being roofed over. Um, you know, again, it was just forming this wall. Um, but you can stand in there and look up and, and see you know, straight up the side of the wall of trees to the sky. Um, the same thing is happening here, but by different means. Um, so rather than someone coming through with pruners, um, the, the landscape architect, and this is definitely designed, um, a designed environment in Potsdam. This is part of uh, Frederick the Great's uh, summer palace grounds. Um, and, uh, and so we're actually looking up the hill to some fake Roman ruins. <laughs> um, and this is a, a transect from the palace that would look up towards up towards this. Um, here, you can tell again on the ground, you know, looking at these trees, they're, they're not pruned at all. This is a landscape architect thinking about this is the size that the crown will be. And this is, you know, the, so the radius that it will achieve in maturity um, and this is the spacing that I will use in order to make a solid wall. You know, there's space more closely along the side, make a solid wall along each side while leaving the roof of the space basically open. Um, and, and to that, I think mean, it's a pretty good demonstration of a lot of the thinking that, the, the level of thinking that we need to do more of when we think about street trees in contexts like, you know, Burlington or even backwards in Vermont, if, uh, you know, we have, uh, if we're going out and, and planting replacement trees, you know, if we don't want shading, if we don't want, um, you know, limbs that are, you know, overhanging in the roadway and breaking and causing those other issues, there is, there's really a mechanism for doing this and it's time tested. It just involves someone who really knows their trees. Um, and so I, I'm, I'm happy to see that VTrans is actually, has a full-time landscape architect who I've been working with a little bit. Uh, and she's sort of pressing forward with giving that knowledge to the, to the, um, the Roman community in the state. Um, <clears throat> it, this photo from Potsdam, a more urban context, the trees are, because of the, of the, of the canopy shape, providing just the roof and not the walls. Um, and you know, this is another thing that we sometimes try to do um, in, you know, like in, in Burlington, you know, you sort of want the shade, you know, on, on the trees and you, you plant species that, that sort of live off relatively high on the, on the, um, on the trunk, uh, you, or that you can prune without much, uh, without uh, affecting the tree all that much, you can prune up fairly high. Um, this photo also shows that it doesn't take that many trees on the street in order to provide uh, a, a substantial amount of canopy. Um, this is a really shaded space. You can't see the, uh, the sky fairly well through that. Um, when I was doing my thesis work, uh, several of you have been involved with numerous presentations. Uh, thank you for coming to all of them. Um, but I, one of the, the predictors that I used was the percent of tree canopy sort of covering a given street space. And people would often ask me, like, how many trees does that, does that entail um, on you know, your sort of average size city block? And I was never really able to come up with a good answer, but I mean, this, this city block has four or five good sized trees and it's almost 100% canopy coverage. So it doesn't take a lot. Um, and then finally, pulling back to a much more rural context, this, this is the photo I have in here of sort of the least intentional tree environment. Um, I, 
the way that I read this landscape is a road was cut through fairly open landscape, and there are agricultural fields on either side, and there's a hedgerow, and whatever grew there didn't get cut down by either the road people or the agricultural people. And so you've got trees of different species, they're different ages, they're certainly not uh, you know, spaced really uh, evenly, although um, you know, there's sort of a natural um, you know, spacing that just because trees can't grow one right next to the other to maturity. Um, but you know, th this is, I think there are a lot of spaces like this, especially in Vermont, that provide all of these benefits that we, and, and some problems that we've talked about related to sort of tree and road spaces that have zero human input at all. But we can't call them not street tree spaces. I mean, they are uh, providing um, those those services, and they deserve they deserve to be classified in that way. And they also um, probably need to be managed in that way. Um, and so, rather than just uh, you know, even something that's evolved naturally can probably use some management um, in, in, in if we want to keep it that way. Um, and then in, in Cornwall, uh, sort of getting back to where we were at the very beginning of the presentation with the sort of dug out street tree, uh, the dug out street trees, this is, I mean, this has formed a tunnel. You know, this, uh, is, this lane is so sort of cut out of the hedges that are around it uh, that the box trucks are, are, are doing the work of um, carving that into sort of a rectangular shaped tunnel as they go through there. Uh, this is something that happens in Vermont a fair amount, actually, uh, where the, you, know, you can sort of see the overhang is, is kind of rectilinear, um, and, and the trucks are, are doing the work of, of keeping that space cleared, um, and that's the degree of intentionality. So there's involvement, you know, there's work being done, or there's an influence being done, you know, being made by humans on the landscape, but uh, it's not plant. <laughs> um, and this is my last. This is my last slide. Um, I, on a very narrow street or, or you know, sort of country lane like this, it's not just trees. And I mean, even certainly in other places, you see we have a lot of sort of hedges, etc. But um, you know, on a nice, you know, with a nice sunset, some nice light, um, and you know, walking along this, you, you realize that there's a lot of vegetation there that is forming that sort of dynamic, naturalistic, um, and very, you know, and, and sort of enclosing space that's the wildflowers, it's the, you know, various ferns and, uh, and bushes, etc. cetera. Um, and these are, you know, beautiful sort of diverse spaces uh, in that they haven't been sort of cut back like crazy. Um, so with that, I will, uh, I guess, open it up for conversation about, I actually was going to go back to these three questions, I guess. Um, so how do these street, street tree spaces develop? Um, a whole sort of range of human involvement, basically. And I, I guess I, I never sort of filled out my, um, filled out my whole sort of spectrum of development. But I, I would say that there's, on one end, you have a very subtractive process where you, you know, literally take a forest and cut a road through it and you know that is the that's the mechanism by which you end up with a corridor of space through trees and on the other hand a very additive process where you take a, a road and you intentionally say this is where the trees need to be around the road and you create this space in that way um, and then really everything everything in between um, and I, I borrow the subtractive and additive uh, terms from the art world that, um, you know, it's like, you, I mean, like she knows what I'm talking about, but certainly in pottery and in, uh, you know, visual arts, you do a lot of, you know, thinking about what's the, what's the, the base condition and then how do I modify that? Um, and trees in some contexts are really the base condition. Certainly in Vermont, they are more often than not. Then the degree of intentionality, um, yeah, there are circumstances where it's very intentional and others where it's not, but that doesn't necessarily change 
the degree of intention with which we need to approach the management of that space. Um, that, I guess would be my my conclusion. I think there's a lot of a lot of places, especially within Britain, where I spent more time in rural places, um, where it, it was clear that the tree wasn't planted by a person for the specific reason of being a street tree, but it's being taken care of because it's a street tree. And it may even be protected by policy because it is within a certain, because it's part of the street space. Um, or it may be, you know, the policy may determine that it needs to be cut. And that, that's certainly part of the management strategy that, um, that we have in the US as well. Um, and then finally, the difference in, in urban and rural contexts. Um, except for the fact that there's probably less intentionality in the, in the urban and rural contexts, I would say there isn't a lot of difference in the way that they affect the user. Probably, and, or, or there's less difference than we may sort of give, give credit for. Um, you know, I think in, in urban contexts, there's sort of an added element of defining a space that's not on the street. So the sidewalk, the public realm that it, you know, in many cases, if you have trees planted in a green space between the roadway and the sidewalk and buildings, et cetera, they are the sort of logical delineator between those spaces. And in, in a rural context, perhaps they do that, you know, where someone has a property behind that space, but people are walking on the road. In, on a Vermont dirt road, um, and uh, and so they they don't quite serve that same purpose, but they still have the role of um, from a, from a human perspective, they have the role of making that feel like a, sort of inviting and animated space. Uh, and so there might be some different management strategies you use in those two places, but if anything, I think I would just draw attention to the value they have in a rural place that we may just sort of generally ignore because the trees aren't being planted. So I think that sort of wraps up my somewhat prepared spiel. If folks have questions or comments, I would love to hear them. Um, yeah. There's a lot of invasive species. There is a lot. I would there's there's potentially less about invasive species with trees because they do have such sort of long, I mean, they're not primary, many trees, especially sort of trees that we would hold onto in the street context are not primary successive species, um, but there's lots and lots of brushy stuff around trees that is invasive. And in fact, that have, were brought, I mean, if you walk around and, um, around uh, farms, there is a tremendous amount of buck farm that was brought from the UK to be a hedgerow head 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 um, And, you know, so in these hedgerows in the UK, you can see there's just tons and tons of stuff that has turned into an invasive species elsewhere. Yeah. Well, a few comments. First of all, no slides in the winter. It's true. And as far as I can tell, every tree was deciduous. Yeah. And so there's a whole seasonal issue. Yep. Second, when I look at that, I think about wildlife jumping from the traffic. Uh, I saw someone wondered in Paris say the trees are poked up to the concrete. When one dies, are they really replenishable? Uh, given that they're in this paper around it. And uh, also, I noticed that about uh, 70 percent of your slides have no people in them. Mm -hmm. And so, the big question was to get on that. Something like that is okay. I'm walking along it or I'm biking, and somebody comes down in a triumph mm -hmm. uh, going 100 times an hour. Yeah. So, there's a whole issue we seem to see about what happens to these things that affect you know, the beans and your slides in so bad. Yeah. And so, you can ask yourself, what's the end point? Is the end point of this to have 20 trucks a day running along 40 kilometers an hour? Or is the point just to become uh, a commuter route to London where I would lots of track and so on? And that actually reminds me of what's going on now in the Church uh, Street and Burlington, where we talk about the new mall in the following. Uh, and putting some new trees 
in pots. So all of these, when I see, when we think about this as a process, is there an end point? Or is it just a standard procedure, which is trees are there until they get in the way, and it's just going to track and move them across? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah I, I think really the, in the case where planting and management of trees is intentional all the way from the beginning, is we're thinking about what you're, you're going to be wanting about it for, um, whether they are going to be in fear of operations on that road, where they get anything. Um, it, you know, in, in, in cases where, you know, like 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 this, where I would say the road, the roadway, and the trees in this case have all really slowly together through a long period of time. Um, and so and this road road probably isn't going to hurt anything very quickly. Um, and in fact, I think in the part of the road there's all the resistance changing the roadway to accommodate. Of the fast moving traffic, larger traffic, the vehicles are so much to accommodate the road right the way around. Um, but, um, you know, certainly in, in a situation like Hurst Street, there was an opportunity to sort of just stand back and say, okay, okay like, how do, we, how do we put the right major trees here in the right type of pot or, or whatnot? So this it is a flexible, minimal space. It makes a lot of sense, I think. Um, it is hard to grow anything aside that I think is more than a long on ornament in a pot. Which is, um, and it's actually a great way. Sometimes, when you don't want to get too large, you put it around in the pot, basically, with a concrete line. So, uh, that could be true. In terms of the seasonality, this is from you know, a month back, a month or two ago, it certainly would be different in effects. Uh, I think a, a nice aspect of um, deciduous trees is that they, they do the bear by the SCC seasons, and so when you're having, um, it, 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 it's just not always the same. Look if you feel to that environment. Conveniently, um, they, they, they also know why so they don't have to see like shade and things like that. So, that's the other thing. The distribution process is more for versus time encouraging and just planning existing species for there. So, um, yeah, there with the extent of that, that once a lot of for the thinking from no different streets. Um, Definitely just not, uh, it, certainly in, in urban areas, not prefer, prefer, prefer to tree in part because they really inhibit the sites. So the, 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 the situation is that, you know, you can make a trunk um, and then a crown, uh, you know, are actually prefer to create space without, um, without a, a, Probably context is diminishing the silence. We're diminishing how people move through that space. Um, a lot of things want to be a pretty long period. There is anything else? <laughs> okay, 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 okay. Well, if we will. I just have a couple of things that are completely unrelated trees, but I thought it was fun. Um, and, and, and it has to do with transition. So this is a switch. And uh, I just love sound. I remember the kids are basically busting through. Watch out. They're really like the plan. Is there no serial warning is a perfect train? I think it makes me so, yeah. And so that was no reason. And then, where did her Tesla 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 Cream. 
I mean, I, mean, I, I think this um, yeah, it was the guy from there. Um, but yeah, I mean, just, this is sort of like they're really, really good at handling small spaces. I mean, they figure out ways to, to, to do it. It doesn't change the environment. But, you know, remember, they just adapt tools and just really little little space. Um, so, um, yeah, and they're generally speaking a lot of fabric and engine about you know, cutting out the That's really it. So maybe you can talk a little bit about so this is your your I mean, I think that there is more of a history and appreciation and tolerance for, 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 for constrained spaces. Um, I think that there is more of an emphasis based on the value of, you know, like, you know, you go into like a, a public process or an how might be like, like changed in Europe. Um, and this is really, really just kind of new several people who live there and have some experience in this realm. But um, if you would really stay in Mecca for the aesthetic space in a different way, way then, then, then folks might around, you know, in the US tradition. Um, and uh, yeah, I, mean, I, I think it's just kind of a different set of predominant values. Um, and it's and a different sense of like, like conformity paradox. I mean, there aren't, there aren't standards of the same way. It's like saying, like, you know, we need this, this reason to be certified, and, you know, or we won't get whatever, just sort of fun lines, et cetera. Um, yeah, but again, I mean, really never heard on that. And so I just think it's just a detail. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's just. Well, I guess there's just a bringing emphasis on context and sensitivity. And so there are certain places where it makes it makes more difference, it makes more sense to have have sight lines really not be changed. I mean, in terms of the case of this. Um, and but I, I think research is really where we need to take those questions. Um, the you know the sight line debate is informed logic to well if I have a longer sight line I can see and then I can sign faster etc etc um, but I mean, the, the research even on the set issue you know is a real world set is fully there and as it emerges it, it actually provides more emission to to, to, to keep between around um, that's actually a lot of great stuff Showing that it doesn't pass your point, you know, like have trees further and further away from the intersections, the intersections, your sight lines, etc. And so I think, you know, pulling pulling away from, you know, just assuming that something is more or rationally, um, you know, true, or that test test, will be really important. 